I'm Frank Kiambo, and I am the director of the Safe Communities Institute, or SCI. And on behalf of the Price School of Public Policy, the University of Southern California, I want to invite you to this morning's lecture series. Now, a lot of folks aren't familiar with SCI, but we've been around for 70 years. Uh, we first started in 1946 as the Delinquency Control Institute, and uh, we went on for 65 years educating over 5,000 public safety officials. Many folks have gone on to become chiefs and sheriffs of law enforcement agencies throughout the country. So we're very proud of that tradition. About four years ago, we decided to look into bringing the Institute into the 21st century by creating a whole of community, an interdisciplinary, uh, uh, multi-jurisdictional program. And that's what SCI is today. We have three major functions, education, research, and community engagement. And so today, we are launching our SCI lecture series. And we have a very exciting guest speaker today. And so to introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Errol Southers, the director of our Homegrown Violent Extremism Studies program in SCI. Errol. Thank you, Frank. And as Frank mentioned, I'm the director of the Homegrown Violent Extremism Studies program in the Safe Communities Institute. Thank you for coming this morning. And so I also have the pleasure of having been a, an adjunct professor in the Saul Price School of Public Policy where I teach Homeland Security and Public Policy. And one of the disclaimers I give to my students each year is cautioning them on social media. Having a security clearance and knowing how competitive it is for our students to gain access to employment in those agencies, it's really unfortunately easy to get in trouble today as you're having background checks done with some of the social media things that may pop up that you may not have had any responsibility for. Well, I, I finally succumbed to social media this year and went on Twitter. It helps to have a 15-year-old daughter as your tutor. And about my third day on Twitter, one of the articles I wrote after the shooting in South Carolina in June was titled, The T Word, America's Terrorist Dilemma After Charleston. The same day that article got tweeted out, I got followed by an individual named Christian Picciolini and I had no idea who he was. And I said, well, let me just go to Google and find out. So I go to Google, and I see that Christian Picciolini heads a group called Life After Hate, and he's got a book called Romantic Violence, Memoirs of an American Skinhead. And so I'm just naturally attracted to these. So I, I bought it, and I couldn't put it down. And it was just an amazing account of someone who had gone through an incredible journey from one end of the spectrum to the other in all respects. Now, as you're going to find out, Christian is the co-founder of Life After Hate, a nonprofit peace advocacy organization. But at 14, he was recruited into the Chicago area skinheads known as Cash. Two years later, after that group's leader went back to prison, he wound up taking leadership of that organization. He then went on to become the head of a white supremacist punk band called Final Solution. And what's interesting about that, they were the first American skinhead band to perform in Europe. And their first concert had over 4,000 people there to let you know the following that they had and how broad this network was. He officially renounced his ties to the American neo-Nazi movement in 1966 at age 22. And talk about turning his life around. He went on to DePaul University and earned degrees. And he moved into an area he knew a lot about, which was the music and media industry. He became executive producer and general manager of a music-themed television program and entertainment media network. Everything this guy does just seems to turn to gold. He changed their format. He wound up with a national distribution deal with NBC, which earned them multiple regional Emmy Awards. I can't begin to tell you that how excited I was when I just reached out in an email. He got back to me right away, and I said, would you come? And he basically said, when? And so it speaks to his courage, it speaks to his dedication, and it speaks to his resolve about fighting hate and sending a message to those people who think that they're going to get caught up in a recruitment effort today. 
So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Mr. Christian Picciolini. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Dr. Southers, for bringing me here. Um, like Dr. Southers mentioned, uh, when I saw him on Twitter, I'm avidly following counter-violent extremism professionals to try and understand their best practices. Uh, and when he mentioned uh, that he had read the book and wanted to have me, I was very eager to come. So thank you. My journey started 20 years ago in 1995 when I left the American White Power skinhead movement that I'd helped build. I was 22 years old at the time, and I had already spent seven years, every one of my formative teenage years, building America's first white power skinhead gang, Chicago area skinheads. As part of that, I was taught, and I taught others, to hate everybody who wasn't like me. But before I joined at 14 years old in 1987, I was a relatively normal kid. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in a mostly Italian neighborhood. My parents, in fact, were Italian immigrants who came to this country in the mid-1960s to get their slice of the American pie and were often the victims of prejudice themselves when they came to this country. They settled in a lower middle class, working class neighborhood of Blue Island right on the south side of Chicago among other people who were just like them, other immigrants who had come from Italy to try and settle down and make a better life. When my parents came here, they had a very strong work ethic. It was something that they believed in so strongly that they, they worked very, very hard to open their own beauty shop, a small beauty shop on the south side of Chicago. But what I think didn't translate from the culture that they had come from and the Amer and new American culture that they had settled in was this idea of work-life balance. So my parents worked extra hard because they really felt that they wanted to support the family structure. And they were very confident that I was being left and loved by family members, grandparents, aunts, and uncles while they were at work, working 14 hours a day, seven days a week. But as a young child, I was insecure. I had low self-esteem. I was looking for a place to fit in. I had started to become disaffected by not having my parents around because I had now learned to live on the street to try and fill the void that not having my family be around me left. So I was full of insecurities. I wanted to fit in, and I wanted to matter. So growing up in this lower middle class neighborhood, I didn't have a lot of opportunity to make that happen, so I spent a lot of time on the street. But I was a relatively normal kid. I was surrounded by love. and. Unfortunately, like other teenagers, I was bullied. I became marginalized, and I felt alienated. And I wanted to belong so desperately to something, and I wanted to do something that mattered. So at 14 years old, when I was standing in an alley, smoking a joint in the middle of the night, and a car, a 1968 Firebird, roared down the alley like a scene out of a movie, spitting up gravel and dust and rocks, and it stopped six inches from me. And a guy came out who was twice my age from the passenger side with a shaved head and with boots. And he looked at me and he pulled the joint out of my mouth and he said, while looking at me dead in the eyes, don't you know that that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile? Now, I was 14 years old. Didn't know what a communist was. I don't think I'd ever met a Jewish person. Hardly knew how to spell the word docile. I was immediately struck by the presence and by the charisma that this 26-year-old man had. This individual was Clark Martell, America's first neo-Nazi skinhead leader. In 1987, America didn't really understand what a skinhead was. In fact, the movement had really been only brought over in 1985 by Clark Martell and a couple of other people from Chicago who had traveled to England and become fascinated with the movement. Prior to that, 
We had instances of the Ku Klux Klan, certainly in the United States, and the American Nazi Party. But there really wasn't a movement for young people to fit into. And Clark, who was very charismatic and very smart, had learned that if he could tailor some of those ideologies to make sense to young people, he knew that he, he could recruit and create an army. So this is me at 14 years old, drinking a stolen beer, reading a stolen book. The book is entitled Skinhead. And this was really my first entree into the skinhead movement. Right across the alley from where I lived, was the first American neo-Nazi skinhead gang in 1987. And like I mentioned, the individual who recruited me was Clark Martell, America's first neo-Nazi skinhead gang leader. So in 1987, when most of America didn't know what a skinhead was, this was before Geraldo Rivera had gotten his nose broken on national television, and before Oprah Winfrey was called a monkey by a skinhead uh, in front of millions of viewers, not many people knew what a skinhead was. They thought it was a subculture, a punk rock subculture of music and of mayhem. And didn't really understand that the ideology that was bubbling under the surface would eventually grow almost 30 years later to be one of the most subversive terrorist organizations in the country. Now, at the same time, I had an identity crisis because while I lived in this Italian neighborhood of Blue Island, my parents now suddenly moved us to a new neighborhood which was an upper middle class neighborhood, and it wasn't Italian. So when I moved, I had a hard time fitting in with the people in this upper middle class neighborhood. We didn't bond on nationality. We certainly didn't bond uh, on the jobs that their parents had. Many were accountants and lawyers and doctors, whereas my family was made of beauticians and blue collar workers. So when I spent my time in school up until eighth grade, I really had this crisis of identity. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know if I was this Italian kid from the south side of Chicago or somebody who was trying to fit in in this upper class neighborhood. And because every day after school I was picked up and brought back to my Blue Island that I loved so much, I didn't really get an opportunity to bond with the, the teenagers that were at my Oak Forest school. Likewise in Blue Island, because I didn't go to school with the kids from the neighborhood, I never had an opportunity to bond with them. So I kind of sat in this, in this little line in the middle and had this anonymity about me that didn't really allow me to fit into any group. So when I went searching for something, and in that alley in 1987, I found that something, I latched onto it. It became very important to me. And although I wasn't politicized right away at 14 years old, I was drawn in by the music, and by the power, suddenly when I was with them, I wasn't picked on anymore. I wasn't marginalized. I didn't feel alienated. I felt powerful. And I started to really become drunk with this sense of power. At 14 years old, it was a very powerful thing. And when I met Clark Martell, my life changed forever. The year was 1987 and I was 14 years old. Now, right after I was 14 years old, other skinhead groups started to pop up around the United States. There were crews in Dallas who were called the Hammerskins. And there were crews in Milwaukee and in Detroit and in other parts of the country, in San Francisco and in Los Angeles and Southern California. And the ideology had started to spread from this, this small Chicago group of skinheads of about 10 people to other parts of the country and suddenly people started to pay attention. Who were the people with the shaved heads and with the tattoos and with the, with the polished boots who would carry around the Confederate flag and the Nazi battle flag? They weren't the punk rockers that they thought were just acting out because of teen angst. It started to become politicized. And at 16 years old, my mentor, Clark Martell, had gone to prison for a string of hate crimes around the Chicago area, and suddenly there was a leadership void. Like my parents who were entrepreneurs, I saw an entrepreneurial opportunity to take over the leadership of this organization, which had now, because their leader had been, had been sent to prison, had been somewhat decimated by people who had fled 
and who had started to grow their hair out and who had gone to prison with Clark. And I saw an opportunity. I saw an opportunity to lead. And I took it. I began to recruit people the same way that I was recruited. By appealing to the things that were happening in their neighborhood that could be blamed on other people. So when I say I grew up in a lower middle class neighborhood, it was a racially diverse neighborhood. The small pocket where I lived was Italian, but it was surrounded by a Hispanic community and an African American community. And what I was taught at 14 years old was that the crime was increasing, not because of my own people who were committing the crimes, but because outsiders were coming in to commit those crimes. The drugs were increasing, not because it was my people who were dealing those drugs, but because outsiders were coming into our neighborhoods to steal our drugs. They were coming into our neighborhoods to rape our women, our sisters, our friends. Now, of course, I didn't see that, but I believed it because I was so proud of something that I was blinded by that pride. So at 14 years old, when Clark Martell and the other skinheads started to tell me that everything that was happening wrong in my life was because of somebody else, I started to listen. They were smarter, they were older, they were charismatic, they were leaders. And two weeks after I met Clark Martell in that alley when I was smoking a joint, my bike was stolen by three black kids, and I was beaten up. That sealed the deal for me. I had to protect my family, my friends, and my neighborhood from what I felt was an outside threat. And suddenly it became very real. The ideology ramped up very, very quickly. It went from hating just the people in the neighborhood who were not like me to hating other ideologies that I felt were a threat to my own. I had started to become politicized in the, in the neo-Nazi movement by that time, and I believed that gays were an abomination, that Jews controlled the government and the media, that the American government itself didn't respect the rights of its people, but wanted to take us down. Now, I was a proud person from a proud neighborhood. And when I felt that somebody was there to attack me, I rose to the occasion, and I was ready to fight back. So at 16 years old, I started to stockpile weapons. And I started to recruit people like I had been recruited by finding disaffected youth and blaming other people for the problems that were happening in their lives rather than what was happening within themselves and within their family and within their homes. And it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Because it was a lower, lower cl uh, middle class neighborhood where parents were out of work, where people suffered from poverty, where kids spent their time on the streets being picked on and bullied and fighting each other. And when I promised them that they could have a better, better life, and if they could accept the fact that the problems that they were having in their lives weren't because of them, it was because of somebody else, we started to get recruits by the dozens. It was as if at, at one moment, almost every teenager in Blue Island had pledged their allegiance to the white power skinhead movement that I was building. In 1992, I had the bright idea of trying to reach more young people through music. Music was a big part of why I was recruited, but there were no bands, there were no record labels who were singing white power music in the United States at the time, or there were very few. Most of what we listened to at the time was coming from England, and it was coming from Germany. And since the United States had just launched this, this skinhead movement, this neo-Nazi skinhead movement in the mid-1980s, nobody had really stepped up and been innovative to try and recruit people. It was very hands-on, it was very face-to-face -face and one-to-one. -one. You would go to a concert, you'd shake somebody's hand, you'd look for the kid who looked like he had the least, and you'd promise him the most. And before you knew it, they would start to come to your meetings. And in 1991, when I started my first white power band called White American Youth with the acronym WAY, because I was going to show people, young people, the way out of their slumber 
we started to attract mass people to our movement. In 1992, I formed a new band called Final Solution, and we were the first American white power skinhead band to travel overseas to play in front of 4,000 people, like Dr. Southers mentioned. We'd sold over 30,000 records in the United States, many more in Europe. And those seeds that I planted almost 30 years ago is what I've committed my life to pulling out today. I am still pulling out weeds from all those seeds that are still sprouting from the ideology that I taught from 1987 to 1995. That's a picture of me in Germany in 1992, where skinheads from all over Europe came in, from Eastern Europe, from Central Europe, Europe and Northern Europe. 4,000 people under one ideology, a hateful ideology, gathered in one room. It's a pretty scary thought. Can you imagine what it would be like if down a couple buildings from here, 4,000 Al-Qaeda members or ISIS members were to gather in one place, what type of impact that would have. Here were 4,000 people, Europeans, gathered under one banner, one hateful ideological banner ready to do harm to anybody that wasn't like them. Now, life in the movement was what you would expect. There was a lot of infighting. There was a lot of splintered organizations that were established. There was no umbrella banner organization at that time. The Ku Klux Klan functioned independently, and skinheads functioned independently with several dozen groups falling under the skinhead banner at the time. In 1987, just to go back, I was taken to my first recruiting uh, meeting in a skinhead's apartment on the south side of Chicago. And some skinheads from Dallas had come up north. And they brought with them this idea of this hammer skin ideology. And they had created this organization called the Confederate Hammer Skins that was based solely in Dallas. But they thought, they had this idea, that because all these skinhead groups were starting to pop up throughout the country, why not put everybody under one umbrella group? And at that meeting, with 20 people, and a 14-year-old Christian Picciolini, the Hammerskin Nation, was born. Years later, it became the most violent, the most well-known, and the most feared skinhead group in the United States, and it sped, it had uh, spread around globally uh, by the mid-'90s. I resisted at first because I was very proud of the Chicago area skinhead group that I was a part of because we were the first. When they came to us and said, we want you to join this thing that we're doing, this hammer skins. The cash skinhead said, no way, man. We're the first ones. You guys are going to join us, if anything. So they hesitated. Years later, when Clark went to prison and I took over leadership of the gang, I saw it as an opportunity to market ourselves under one banner. And I folded Chicago area skinheads into the hammer skins. And I became a local director for the northern hammer skins. Soon, I became a regional director for the Northern Hammerskins, where I was responsible for several northern states. Through the band, I had started to get regional acclaim and international acclaim through the music that I was putting out and the people that we were recruiting. And in the early 90s, the skinhead movement was a large phenomenon with a lot of violence. And in 1988, which we dubbed the Summer of Hate, kicked off a firestorm of violence that is still going on today. I became a skinhead because I felt marginalized, because I felt bullied, because I felt disconnected from society. Now, that wasn't anybody else's fault but my own. I was a shy kid. So at 19 years old, when I met the woman that I loved, and I got married, and had my first child, 
Suddenly, holding that innocent child in my hands, I was able to reconnect for the first time in seven years to that innocence that I felt before I was 14 years old. I once again was able to humanize people like I hadn't done for seven years when I was a part of this movement. When I held my child, the love that I felt began to push out the hate that I had learned. I wasn't raised a racist. I was raised to respect people who were different than me. Because like I mentioned, my parents came to this country in the mid-1960s and were often the victims of prejudice themselves. So racism is something that I learned. It's not something I was born with. And it's something that I taught other people to have. So it's something that I believe can be unlearned as well. But my wires got crossed. And at 19 years old, when I had my child, while I was f reconnecting with this empathy, with this compassion that I hadn't felt in seven years, somehow my wires got crossed. And I went back to something that I learned in a movement called the 14 words. And the 14 words is a mantra that the white power movement use, uses to this day that says, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. And holding my child while I was filled with empathy and with compassion again, and I caught a glimpse of who I used to be, and my wires got crossed, I realized that I needed to do whatever I, I had to do to protect my small white child from this world that was trying to take down the white man. My wires got crossed. So I dove back headfirst into the movement. And I opened a record store on the south side of Chicago called Chaos Records in, 19, in late 1994. Now, because I had built a life in this movement, and because I knew that music was such a powerful weapon to recruit young people at that time, it was a great way to build community, and I had been selling music out of my backpack that I had been ordering for years from Germany and from England, I had the bright idea, again, an, another entrepreneurial desire, just to be like my parents, that I was going to open a record store and sell white power music. So I borrowed $3,000 from my parents, and I opened, and I started credit lines, and I opened this record store in a couple of months, and I imported music from Europe, this white power music. And before I knew it, it started to become 75% of my revenue. Now this was pre-internet, pre-consumer internet. So 1994, 1995, that meant people were driving in from all parts of the United States to get this white power music from my store. But because I wanted to be a good business person, I also realized that I needed to serve the masses. So I started to add other music to the store and I started to keep the white power music behind the counter. And I sold ska and I sold heavy metal and I sold punk rock. And before I knew it, I started to have people come into my store that I had alienated from my social circle for almost seven years at that time. I started to dialogue with my first African Americans. I started to meet Jewish people for the first time. Hispanics came in and I became friends with them and we bonded over music. And what was interesting was because I had gotten into the movement because of music, I was now starting to meet people and bond with people over music that I had normally, for those seven years, not wanted to do, not wanted to have anything to do with. But because I wanted to be a good business person, I bit my tongue and I talked to them. And before I knew it, I started to realize that I had more in common with the people that were coming into my store who I had alienated from my social circles than I did with the people who I'd called family for seven years, this brotherhood. It wasn't easy at first, because I was making a life change. And there wasn't a whole lot of trust for me because I was well known, and I think now that these people came into my store intentionally to try and knock me down, to try and crack my shell, because it was a relatively small town, a small neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, and I was very well known at the time. But what I wasn't expecting was to humanize them. The dialogue that we had allowed me to humanize them, not as adversaries, not as enemies, but as people. 
And I started to believe that the ideology that I had learned had flaws. It did not make sense to me anymore. I couldn't rationalize the hate with this newfound compassion that I had started to feel. So that was a large catalyst for my change. So now between my children being born and having that connection to the innocence and this new set of friends, and I wasn't calling them friends at the time, but this new set of acquaintances that I'd been building at the time, I started to recognize that my ideology was built on sand. I saw flaws. There were things that logically didn't match up anymore. And the hate had become exhausting. Because it wasn't natural for me. It was something that I went out of my way to do so that I could hate more than the next person. Because at this point, I was a well-respected leader who had recruited people, and I couldn't show my cracks. And throughout those seven years, I had what I call in my book these moments of clarity, these moments of compassion or empathy. One such incident was when I was 19 years old and I was in a McDonald's after hours after drinking with some skinhead friends. And about midnight, we walked into this McDonald's and we saw three African-American youths in line. And I walked up to one of them and I took the hat off of his head and I put it on my head. And I said, this is my hat now. And of course, we were scary looking skinheads. We were much older than they were. They were probably 15 or 16 at the time and we were 19 or 20. They immediately ran out of the McDonald's and we immediately chased them. It wasn't until we crossed the street when one of those individuals turned around and fired six shots at us from his pistol and missed. And we didn't break a stride to continue to tackle this person and beat him to the ground senselessly to the point where we couldn't see his face. We couldn't see through the blood that had accumulated from the cuts in his face and his head that this, that this was even a person. It looked like a crumpled heap on the ground. And I remember thinking at one point when I was kicking him that this could have been my brother that it could have been my son. And for just a moment, I connected with that individual as he looked up for me, looked up to me asking for mercy. But I quickly took those feelings and I pushed them aside because I had a mission. But it left an impression on me. And throughout those seven years, I continued to have those moments of clarity that began to build and to snowball until I couldn't ignore them anymore. Because those were natural feelings that I was having. The hate wasn't a natural feeling. It was a mask. It was a uniform. It was an ideology based on irrationality and ignorance and fear. Because when we don't understand something, when we're ignorant of something, we become afraid of it. And when we become afraid of something, we learn to hate it. And when we hate something so deeply, sometimes the only way to eradicate it is through violence. And that's the process that I went through, from ignorance to violence. Had I taken the time to understand and to educate myself and to not be afraid of something or somebody that was different than me, perhaps I wouldn't have gone down that road. I always joke that had it been a group of ballerinas that grew up across the alley from me at 13 years old, I could perhaps have been the best ballerina in the world. Unfortunately, I became one of the best or worst skinheads in the world. So when I decided to pull the white power music from the shelves because I'd become embarrassed to sell it to these new friends that I had made who had come from many diverse backgrounds, it accounted for 75% of my revenue. Of course, my sales tanked and I had to close the store. And I was happy to do so. 
Because what I had gained from that experience, what had changed was not what I had lost, but what I had gained through this new humanity, this reconnection to the empathy that I had prior to joining at 14 years old. So when I pulled the records, the store tanked, I closed it, but I retained these friendships and I started to distance myself from the movement. And it wasn't easy because I was a leader, but I was a selfish leader and I never groomed anybody to take over after me. So when I left the movement and I, as I pulled away slowly with the excuse of I needed time to raise my family, I needed time to work, initially the people under me understood that. But eventually when I stopped showing up to meetings that I used to lead, and I stopped looking like they did, and I grew my hair out, and my language and my mannerism started to change, well that's when I became a traitor, and that's when they wanted to kill me. So for five years I went through this very, very deep depression. Ideologically I had changed. I had walked away from this movement that I helped build. And I went into hiding, in plain view, I must say, but I went into hiding ideologically. I didn't talk about what I believed for those seven years. I thought, I'm a different person now. I can just do better things and move forward and I'll be accepted. That couldn't be farther from the truth because what I had done by thinking I could outrun it, was I wasn't healing because I wasn't talking about my past. I wasn't educating other people on what I had learned. And I thought that if I didn't talk about it and I just outran it, it wouldn't follow me. And because of that, for five years, from 1995 to late 1999, almost 2000, I suffered a major depression. I had lost everything. I had lost my parents because I had alienated them from my circles and I didn't have a good relationship with them anymore. I had lost my job and my livelihood because my store shut down when I decided to pull the white power music. I would lost my wife and children because my transformation out of the movement didn't happen fast enough and they were never a part of it. Funny enough, it wasn't something that I wanted to take home with me. It wasn't something I wanted my wife to be a part of. It wasn't something that I indoctrinated my young children to do because I felt that it was a dirty movement. I wanted to carry them on my shoulders. I wanted to be their savior and I wanted them to come along with me, but it wasn't something that I wanted them to practice. So something inside of me knew that this wasn't right for me and my family. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to pull out fast enough. My wife and children left. So now I was out of work. I didn't have a family, and my social structure that I had built for seven years imploded. And not only did I have to start from ground zero to regain all that back, I had to climb out of the hole that I had built for myself because I was a racist and everybody knew it. Now, I wasn't a racist anymore. I, I, I had uh, friends from diverse backgrounds and I had dropped my ideology and I had already started to work against the racism that I had built but that, the stigma never went away. The people that were from my neighborhood and the people that knew me nationally, on one side hated me because I was a traitor and on the other side hated me because I was, in their eyes, a racist. And it wasn't until 1999 when a friend of mine happened to tell me about a temporary job at IBM. And I didn't have any technological background. In fact, I'd been kicked out of five high schools, one of them twice. And I thought that there was no chance for IBM, for Big Blue to hire me. But I applied, and I faked it, and I got the job. And I started out as a, as a temporary marketing operations specialist doing uh, research on companies in the dot-com space who were receiving VC funding. And of all the millions of places that IBM could have placed me, literally millions of places that IBM has reached into that they could have put me for my first project. They put me at my old high school for a computer rollout program, the one that I'd gotten kicked out of twice. 
Now, of course, I was terrified. This was my first chance. This was my first opportunity to do something with this new life that I had after being in this depression for five years and, and not really doing much and struggling for, for a job and struggling to survive. I was terrified because I thought the first thing that was going to happen was somebody was going to point me out and say, there's that neo-Nazi guy, get him out of here, and I'd be fired. And as it turns out, the first day I was there, I saw the security guard who I, the black security guard who I'd gotten in a fist fight with to get kicked out the second time. I didn't know what to do. And I stood around a corner and I waited for him to pass down the hallway because I didn't want him to see me. But because I didn't know what to do, instinct kind of took over and I chased after him down the hallway and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, Mr. Holmes. And he turned and the normal smile that he had on his jovial face suddenly turned into a scowl. And I said, do you remember me? And he said, I do. And I didn't want to apologize because I didn't seem like it was fitting. I didn't want to demean him by saying I'm sorry for something that I had done. So I said to him, Mr. Holmes, I want you to know that I'm not the same person that I used to be. And he looked at me. And this was a man that I had been physically in an altercation with, an older gentleman. And he turned to me and he extended his hand. And I took it. And we shook, and it was as if the heavens opened up and this redemptive light surrounded us. And he made me promise that I was going to tell the world about my transformation. And so I decided to stop running. And I decided to tell my story. What's my life like now, 20 years post-movement? I'm happily married for over 10 years. I've been with the woman I love for 14. The young boys that changed my life are now 23 and 21. <clears throat> and I've spent the last 20 years trying to erase and combat the, the damage that I did. I also published my book. Because I was urged to tell my story, I spent 10 years in very raw detail describing what life was like in the movement. What a young person was promised to become part of something that is unnatural and detrimental to our society. And I wrote it as a cautionary tale for other people who might be experiencing the same feelings that I had of alienation that may draw them into these hate groups. In 2010, I co-founded an organization, a nonprofit called Life After Hate, which is a prevention program targeted at far-right far -right extremists. We develop curricula with universities and with high schools and with grade schools to try and teach them the mentality of these young people who join these groups, to teach them the warning signs. We're an advocacy group who teaches diversity and compassion. Just this year, we launched a program called Exit USA. It's the first of its kind in the United States. And this is our intervention model. Anybody can go to exitusa.org and contact us anonymously through a form if they're involved in a hate group and they want out. Because when I left the movement and when all the people who Life After Hate, and by the way, Life After Hate is made up also of all former far-right extremists who've been doing amazing things with their lives for the last 20 years. When we left, there was no support group. There was nobody to turn to. There was no help. We've decided to help without any judgment. We want to help people get out of hate groups. So you can email us, you can text us, or you can uh, call us, and we will help you. If after the vetting process, we've seen that you've made an ideological change, but yet you've not been able to move forward with your life in a positive way, we will work with them to provide them job training or tattoo removal or counseling, mental health counseling. 
this never existed, and I feel that if it would have existed 20 years ago, it could have gone a long way to de-radicalizing de a lot of people who, in the years since then, have caused some pretty tragic damage. What does the movement look like today? The Southern Poverty Law Center estimates that 784 active hate groups exist in the United States, in every state. I think that number is low, and that should be a good sign, right? People might be leaving groups. We're seeing a reduction in people leaving groups, but it's not, in my opinion, a good thing because there was something that we taught in the mid-'80s that is still prevalent today, and that is the concept of leaderless resistance. Leaderless resistance is what you would equate to being a lone wolf. We understood in the 80s that it was much easier for law enforcement to infiltrate organizations if there was a leadership structure, if there actually was an organization. So we taught people, after we had indoctrinated them, we kicked them out of the nest and we taught them to go cause the most damage on their own, untied to an organization as a lone wolf. And while white supremacy used to look like this in the 80s and 90s, and in many cases still does, where you can spot a skinhead walking from a mile away because of the shaved head and the swastika tattoos or the Klan robes and the Confederate flags, that's not the case anymore. Because the new face of white racist extremism looks like this. He looks like your neighbor or your son's friend. And this individual walked into a church in South Carolina several months ago and murdered nine innocent people. This is the face of white, far-right extremism today. Tied to white supremacy in this country, we're also seeing a rise in what we call sovereign citizens, individuals who are pro-Constitution, who don't believe that the current government represents them, so they set up their own government. We also see militia and patriot groups, organizations who organize with the primary directive to take down the US government, to protect themselves from the rights that they feel are being taken away. Racist skinheads are still prevalent. Ku Klux Klan groups are still out there. But for the most part, they look like the people in this room. And I wanted to show a video, but I know we're running out of time, so I'll just quote the statistic that since 9-11, more white supremacists, terrorists, have killed people in this country on US soil than Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and ISIS combined. This is a real threat. This is a threat to law enforcement, which they specifically target. Social media is important, whereas when I was recruited, it was face-to-face. -face. It was very high touch. It was a flyer at a concert to a disaffected youth. Now, these groups are leveraging the power of social media and the internet, and this is a, a, probably the most prevalent uh, website for racists. It's called stormfront.org. Uh, and an FBI agent told me just a year ago that almost every instance of white power terrorism in this country can be tied to somebody who's been a member or posted on this website. The internet's both good and bad when it comes to countering violent extremism. On one hand, it allows us to serve a counter narrative to people and to find these people. But on the other hand, it provides this, this layer of anonymity that exists when any, where anybody can post anything and say anything without it being tied to you and to post disinformation that attracts youth to these extremist ideologies. White supremacy has now gone into the mainstream. We see people who have graduated from skinhead groups and neo-Nazi groups and KKK groups go into biker organizations. They've gone into organizations like the Tea Party and become the extreme members of the Tea Party. And the rhetoric is the same. They've replaced the N-word, in some cases anyway, with words like immigrants, 
and people who are here to leech off our system. So while the inflammatory language has been toned down a little bit, the ideology has grown, it's spread. And while numbers in these organizations has gone down over the last couple of years, actual recruitment has gone up. So what can we do? As educators, as law enforcement, as citizens, as students, as parents. First of all, support the groups that are leading the work. There are some amazing organizations out there like the Simon Wiesenthal Center and the Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center and government organizations who are keeping an eye on the neo-Nazi threat, the white supremacist threat in this country. Groups like Life After Hate are there to support people and to, to educate people who might be at risk of going down that lifestyle. We're also there to do interventions. On a more practical level, we can start with our young people by teaching them empathy at a very, very young age. Because so often, our kids are the victims and the perpetrators of bullying and don't make that human connection at a young age. And I feel that if we can teach our young kids to have that empathic connection early on, that will steer them away from these racist ideologies that don't make any sense. When we see instances of racism and inequality, we need to talk about them. We cannot sweep them under the rug. In, our, in America, while we have you know, a legacy of being progressive in race relations, in many ways, we're still in the same places that we were in the 50s and the 60s because media cycles stop talking about the important issues and we tend to sweep them under the rug and we politicize causes. So we need to keep talking about it. If you see something, say something, act. One thing that Dylan Roof said before he walked into that, Char or as he walked into that Charleston church, the Mother Emanuel church, is you people are so nice, I almost don't wanna do this. What did he do? He told his roommates, he told his friends that he was gonna do this. With the Oregon shooter, it's believed that that person posted something online. In most of these cases, when we have a lone wolf or an active shooter situation, they've told the people around them, they've told the bystanders in their life that they're gonna do this. But because we're sometimes too afraid to throw our children under the bus or to turn them in or to be the friend that rats out the friend, we don't do that. We need to start taking these threats seriously because it's better to be safe than sorry. And know the warning signs, of course. In your children, in young people, if you see drastic changes in personality, if you start to see withdrawal happen, if you start to see collecting of guns or paraphernalia and the, you know, the typical warning signs and the language changes, those are all indicators that something is not right because people only do something, they only work, walk into a church and murder people or they only behead somebody if they're not happy, if something is missing in their life. Happy people do not commit tragic mass shooting acts. So find what's missing and let's give it to these young people. I just wanna say thank you so much for having me here to speak to you. It's a, it's a diverse group of law enforcement and academics. And uh, as part of those worlds, there's all a part that you can play. Violent extremism is something that is a threat right now, both domestically and foreign. And I urge you to just take that one step. If you find somebody who's ignorant or if you feel ignorant on a subject yourself, educate yourself. Take that extra step because change is possible. 20 years ago, I didn't believe that, but here I am to tell you about it. I wanna say thank you very much again to Dr. Southers for having me, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry about the football game last night. <laughs> We're a Pac-12 family, I'm a Sun Devils fan. So. Uh, I'll take a few questions. If anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer some of your questions. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship with your parents? Sure. So she asked uh, about, for me to talk about the relationship with my parents. Uh, as you can expect, being immigrant parents and being Italian, you know, there's always a lot of love and a lot of family around. And that was very much the case growing up. There was always somebody around. My parents weren't around, and I really missed them. Uh, and I, w I think I was you know, doing a lot of this initially to get their attention. 
But I had, I had really alienated myself from that relationship during those years, even though they tried their best to get me out. My relationship now with my parents is great uh, because when I became an adult and when I had my own children, I suddenly realized that the trials and tribulations that they had been through to raise me, and God bless them, they, I put them through hell. Um, but when I became a parent, I suddenly realized how important that bond is between a parent and a child. And I'm so, so grateful for them for never abandoning me through this. Um, they really had a large impact and were a huge catalyst in my change. Yes? So first I want to thank you. Um, I'm very happy I'm here. I want to thank um, Earl and, and Frank uh, for inviting me to share this story with us. I work for city government. I'm with the Human Relations Commission. And we tackle a lot of those um, issues. And, and these are very complex yes. issues and, and very deep at a human level, um, which makes it even more difficult at a policy level to, to make those connections. Um, one of the things that, and I could spend two hours just talking to you, but I'll keep it to one question because I know they're going to kick me out of here. Um, when you're dealing with the notion of extremism and violent extremism, our world has evolved, and it has yes. evolved tremendously. So just as much as we look at how do we tackle this notion of violent extremism, while on that spectrum we're dealing with white supremacists, solid citizens, but also we're dealing with an international ideology uh, that is coming from groups like ISIS, which is now such a huge global threat. Um, and yet we also have to deal with it domestically. Sure. And as we look and compare and sort of contrast the similarities with, just as you've talked about the ideology, just as you talked about the identity crisis, um, just as you talked about how do we fit from a social perspective, at a social level, we're also struggling with how do we create a social shift mm -hmm. towards dealing with those issues. So if you can maybe talk a little bit about the intervention, because this is an sure. area where it's a very challenging area to deal with, because as we create intervention for games, for example, which inhibit very similar aspects of identity crisis, Absolutely. how do we gear that towards white supremacists, how do we hear that and make it much more relevant? I'm going to answer that in two ways. So I think that intervention is important because we obviously have a problem that exists. And uh, we have a lot of at-risk people who may become foreign fighters and may go to Syria to, you know, to fight for ISIS. When I was 16 years old, I wanted to be a foreign fighter. I submitted an application to the Africana Resistance Movement in South Africa because I wanted to go fight for apartheid. Now, they turned me down because I was too young, uh, but it's not, in, it's not that different than what's happening now with how ISIS is using social media to recruit young people to go fight there. Um, and you're right when you say that there really is very little difference between how these groups operate. ISIS, uh, skinheads, gangs in the inner city, they recruit the same kids, these kind of disaffected, marginalized, picked on kids and promised them something greater than what they have. And they can't deliver on it, obviously. So I, I believe in intervention. I think it's important. And we're actually, devel I've developed a model of intervention uh, that is being used by some law enforcement. It's currently being uh, worked on by Homeland Security and the FBI um, on an intervention model where we will go in to at risk people who are at risk of violence, have already been indoctrinated, have been part of these movements, but are at risk of violence to off-ramp them. Because let's face it, we just don't have the resources to fight this like we should. And oftentimes, it's out of the FBI's jurisdiction if these folks haven't committed a crime. So they want to send people like me, formers, who understand the mentality, who understand the language, can make a connection with these people and, and relate to why they got in or why they might want to get out. So I think that's, that's important, but I also want to talk just a second about prevention because I think that intervention is sometimes a Band-Aid for a problem you know, that exists that may never go away if we don't do something to eradicate it altogether. Uh, and I certainly you know, am not under the impression that we would be able to eradicate this 100% because there's always going to be something, but I think we can make a large dent in violent extremism in this country and also abroad by educating people. 
the operative word is creating opportunity for young people, for disaffected people. Because right now, outside of, outside of Chicago, and I, and I live on the west side, and less than a half mile from where I live are some of the most violent neighborhoods in the city. And we hear a lot about Chicago being one of the murder capitals in the, in the country. Uh, and what's true about those neighborhoods is they don't have the same opportunity that I do where I live. They don't have public transportation lines that can take them to jobs. They live in food deserts. They sometimes have role models, sometimes the only role models that they have in their lives are somebody at the end of the block who might be a gang leader or a drug dealer who uh, you know, can promise them the same type of life because there aren't job opportunities in some of these neighborhoods. And I think that creating opportunity for people is the secret ingredient. Because like I said, happy people don't murder people necessarily. They don't behead people. They don't want to go fight in Syria and search for a better life, a promise of a better life, if what they have is already satisfying them. So I think, uh, you know, it's a very complex issue. Everybody I've done an intervention on has, has got a different set of needs, a different set of wants, a different set of circumstances. And I don't want to oversimplify it by saying, you know, let's just you know, put train stops in, in, in underserved neighborhoods. It's a lot more complex than that. And everybody I've done an intervention with has been a, a very tailored situation. But I think what it boils down to is, is opportunity. Happy people don't do bad things in most cases. So, yes. Hi, Christian. Jason Perrin with the Jewish Federation of Security. Hi, Jason. Uh, first of all, thank you for using your personal story to, to do something about hate groups. Um, I'm talking. Obviously, with something we're very interested in. The question is, talking about uh, populations that are very uh, targeted, does your exit USA organization deal with uh, prisons, prisoners that are being released, like just before release, or people that Prisoners who wanted to find the organization. Yeah, in fact, uh, we, we did a soft launch of Exit USA just six months ago where we didn't really promote it. It wasn't ready for prime time, but we put the website up. And some of the first people that contacted us were actually prisoners uh, who wanted to do something similar in their prison. They're really, you know, they were part of support groups and part of uh, you know, peer mentoring and things like that. But they didn't have anybody specific to talk to about their former life that you know, in prison is sometimes represented by a very bad element called the Aryan Brotherhood. And it was very dangerous for them to talk about it. So they talk to us anonymously through that, and we, we correspond with them. Um, we, we are under-resourced at the moment, because we're a very small organization. But that is absolutely something that we, uh, that we want to do, because we see that transition from prison into the real life that something like Exit USA, something, something like the support structure that's needed is, is very necessary. Uh, so we are, there are some projects that we're working on where we're uh, doing some research on how that might shake out and what it might look like. Uh, but absolutely, um, we want to focus on young people at risk, but we also want to focus on people who are getting out to provide them the resources that they need. One last question. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between the Aaron Brotherhood there's a pretty distinct split. There's some, definitely some overlap. The question was, can I talk about the Aryan Brotherhood, which is prevalent in, in prisons, and kind of the movement on the street. Um, Aryan Brotherhood is very much a prison movement. That's not to say that people who were in prison don't get out and were members of Aryan Brotherhood don't join other movement gangs. There's absolutely some crossover. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's really, I'm not an expert on it. I've never been to prison, but I think that the ideologies are just the same, but the methodologies are different. So while they're, they may be more involved in, in uh, violence, one-on-one, -on -one, and drug dealing, and things like that, typically the movement was not. Um, so there's overlap, but they're, they're not connected. Ideologically, it's very, very similar. Um, but I don't think it goes much further beyond that. Folks, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking out of your day to come. Um, and I hope you've learned something. I hope I was able to share something with you that you can take with you and, and implement. And thanks again, Dr. Southers.